true only competitive advantage in the marketplace is our culture. That's it. That's our only competitive advantage. Our guarantees can be copied. Our whatever, our hours of service can be copied. We could, we could come out with a, a, a two-year financing program. Somebody's gonna come out with a five-year financing program. Everything can be copied or replicated. What, what is the competitive advantage is our culture. Hey, what's up to the point listeners? It's your boy, Chris. We've got an exciting episode today. There are three other faces on the screen right now. If you're watching it on YouTube, if you're not, well, then you're going to be listening to three other people that are on the podcast episode. So there is four in total, a beautiful little quartet, and we have got a fantastic group of leaders on this. Oh gosh, this is going to be exciting. So everybody on this podcast has been on an episode before. So not only are we joined by my co-host, Mr. Chad Peterman. Chad, I'm glad to see your face. Welcome back, buddy. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, glad to join, uh, especially for this episode. I, I saw the invite come over, what was that, a week or so ago? And uh, yeah, uh, I get excited about all the guests, but uh, these these two in particular, for sure. Um, wait, so the others you're not excited about? As my I said I was excited about them. I said I was extremely excited about these two. Don't twist okay. my words now. Yeah, no, it's fine. I just like to make Chad feel as uncomfortable as I possibly can. Every opportunity that I get, uh, mission accomplished. So the other two guests we have on here have been previous guests on this podcast before. We have Mr. Jonathan Bancroft joining us again, regional CEO of Wrench. I get that right. Uh, is it now formerly... CEO of Morris Jenkins is that formerly is that right Jonathan uh, I am perfectly okay with that Chris yeah we made a transition <laughs> here about a month ago and uh so yeah we've got a new president uh here at Morris Jenkins Brandon Anderson is doing a fantastic job it's been under construction for a long time so yeah that's uh for formerly of Congre Morris Jenkins uh, but still still got some irons in the fire with uh, the great partners here at Wrench of course of course yeah well congratulations on that too that's exciting for you um, and then also we have Kevin Comerford again coming back to us, president of the service champions in Northern California. And one of the, listen, this guy came fired up this morning, right? Text messaging us early in the morning about some ideas he had, um, but is going to be joining us at Rhino X uh, as one of our legend speakers for 2025. We're excited, Kevin, to have you come out. Jonathan joined us last year and uh, had a great time. And uh, I think he'll be able to tell you it's a little bit different of an event that you've probably been to. It is much smaller, more intimate, a lot of you know really great players in there. It's a lot of fun. Uh, of, course, I, of course, I might be a little biased, but excited to have you guys both back on. Now, your previous episodes where Kevin was on episode 117 back in April of 2022, which seems like wow, hey, it's yeah, it's gonna, we're, we're coming up on 25. It's weird to think that already. Mm -hmm. Yes. But and then um, JB was on in May of twenty May of twenty twenty three, and that was episode one seventy two. I'm not even sure what episode are we even on right now. And we're in the two two forty something. Okay, so we've done a few episodes. Um, so if you want to go back and listen to to, to those, um, and then both again are attending Rhino X twenty twenty five. So I appreciate you guys both coming in for that. Chad will be there as well. We've kind of got a nice little shakeup of things that we're going to do. But hopefully, what this is is kind of a, gives you a little bit of a glimpse into what this is going to look like. And I like things to be a little bit more conversational, not so like Q and a style. So what came from this is when we had uh, Jonathan and Paul Kelly doing a fireside chat at, at uh, Rhino X, they had really great feedback from the attendees on how much they loved that style of those guys were kind of interviewing each other back and forth. It was awesome. Uh, in rocking chairs by a campfire. Yes, it was inside uh, with drinks in hand. All right, so the only thing we're missing today is all of those things. <laughs> no campfire, no drinks in hand, I don't think, uh, you know, and uh, no rocking chairs. But everybody's here, and I'm excited about it because we came up with a couple of topics at a time that we think that uh, all the listeners will enjoy hearing, especially hearing it from this group of uh, incredibly successful men in the trades. So, guys, real quick, um, we talked about a couple of topics and, and even though uh, I have, you know, a, an idea of the things I want to, I want to go down on the, um, as far as in the agenda goes, I'm completely okay with things going sideways if we get derailed and go down a path. Um, and, and I'm going to open it up, like treat this as we're all just co-hosts. 
Okay. We're all just co-hosting this podcast. We're all just kind of sitting around, hanging out, having conversations. Cause you know, a lot of times you'll hear people say, man, I wish I could be someone in the room. You know, I want this to be the room. They're just in their car or at the gym or on their airplane listening to this. That's their room. So I want to treat it that way. So is everybody ready to roll? Everybody good to go? I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's go, baby. Kevin's fired up. I'm ready. Kevin's I'm ready. Up. I'm chomping at the bit. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready, Chris. I'm ready. And so, uh, Chad, I'm, uh, you know, I, I can I just say a couple things real quick just to get started? Hey, listen, your show today. It's yeah. I, you know, I wanted, I was thinking about coming back on the podcast and, and how much like I, you know, I'm excited to be back on. I, I feel like Chris, you, you continue to get the good word out in our industry. And I just want to thank you for that because um, I, 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 the last thing I wanted when I first got in this business was to be in the HVAC business. I was in the sports industry. I worked for the Raiders for two seasons. I worked for the San Jose Sharks. Thought I wanted to go down the road of sports attorney. And in 1994, I saw more opportunity in home services than I did today. Or excuse me, than I, sorry, than I did in the sports industry. So I saw more opportunity in home services than I did the sports industry. A hell of a pivot. I tell you, the same is true today, Chris. So I just appreciate all you're doing to get the word out. So much so, I thought, you know what? If I could be half of what Chris is doing, I'm going to start my own podcast, you know? So here we go, baby. So you're doing it? I'm doing well, it. he has. He has. He's he's got a uh, he's he's got a project working on within Wrench. We're very excited about it. Yeah. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank so, you. You know what? I I feel I feel very lucky. I appreciate well, you sharing your news with me. I'm excited for you. You're an inspiration. Um, I I I was I saw you and was on your show in 2022, and that thought was always in my mind that you know he's. He's doing the right things. He's getting the word out in our industry. This industry is fantastic. We need more people to know and hear and learn about the opportunities. Uh, and it's just, it's, I'm just delighted. I'm just excited to be here and happy to be participating, especially with this group. Yeah. I, well, I appreciate you saying that. It's very awesome. And, and so when will the, is it like, so is it, or is it open? It's like, this is for not just for wrench. This is for everybody, right? Yeah. So, so. Uh, Jonathan mentioned he stepped down as president. Uh, I, I stepped down as president of Service Champions in January of 2024. Okay. So, so I, I have brought in another a gentleman by the name of Dan Mickey. Again, it's been in process. He's been he, he started with Service Champions in 2014. Great, great guy. Uh, doing a great job, and will do a great job. Uh, my focus has kind of shifted. I guess you could say I'm I'm, I'm kind of I'm the chairman of the board still of service champions locally, also really working a lot on culture. So I know that's one of the topics we're going to touch on today. That's one of my passions, culture inside of wrench. Um, I I've signed up to do 24 episodes over the next 18 months for the wrench group, uh, talking about culture and also highlighting and showcasing the top talent inside wrench, interviewing them, find out, Finding out what their secret sauce is. Well, you certainly have plenty of that to pull from in that group. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, got a I, I got a question for you both. I think this would be an interesting one because this is one we just came off of Service Titans Pantheon, uh, Tommy's Home Service Freedom, the Next Star event, all of those things. And I think the one question I got asked the most, um, and I think it's top of mind, and obviously you guys have just transitioned someone into kind of your seat. And obviously, a lot of listeners, not your size, totally different animal, maybe smaller, but like, what are the couple of things that you felt or are seeing that are important when it came to that transition of leadership and or grooming a potential leader? Like, what did that like, okay, this person I think is the person like what, what did that look like for you? And it could be more high level or just some, you know, tidbits of like, oh yeah, this was a super important thing that we made sure that they had or that they were focused on so that they could continue on kind of what we had already built. Hmm. Yeah, for me, it was about, uh, you know, uh, maturity and uh, the maturation process over time. Like, I just didn't want somebody to parachute into this organization 
and uh, check a bunch of boxes and not a bunch of heads and and just say like, yeah, I got it. Uh, so for me, you know, Brandon uh, had been here 19 years, uh, much like Dan Mickey at Service Champions for now 10 years. It was very important that we got to see the step up in leadership capability over time. So it was a construction project that started. Uh, I became president of Morris Jenkins in 2014. And like the next day, it just resonated in me that part of my job is not just leading the organization, but finding who the next president is going to be. Uh, and it was one of the lessons I got from uh, our chairman, Dewey Jenkins, that at any given moment, it's been strength. It's about developing people uh, either through education, uh, through opening their eyes to the opportunities that they have. And so my focus was finding who the next president was going to be. Was that 10 years down the road? Would it Could it have been 20 years down the road? Maybe, but um, I didn't know it was going to be Brandon, but, um, and once, you know, we started to identify Brandon with those leadership capabilities, it was, it was about, you know, do they get the grasp of the foundational principles of our organization? Uh, it's about the amount of time that they were spending outside the normal working hours. <clears throat> were they, were they waking up in the middle of the night thinking about improvements of the organization and, and coming in, racing in the next morning to talk about it? So, for me, it was very intentional to make sure it was homegrown. I am homegrown in this industry, and I was homegrown here at Morris Jenkins. I started out as an apprentice here. Brandon started out as an HVAC install apprentice. And so <laughs> that <laughs> what are the qualifications to one day become president for either of us? Mm. Uh, but for me, I think part of my secret sauce was making sure that it was internal and that it was uh, matured over time. That's great. And I would, I would add one of the things I've learned is that the person that you bring in is going to be different than you and that's okay. They're going to have different strengths. They're going to have different qualities. Is it going to be, are they going to jump around and be super enthusiastic like Kevin? Maybe not, probably not. And that's okay. That's okay. And also understand that you put this person in the role as president it's like when I was 16 years old, I became a driver. Like I became a driver. I wasn't a great driver at 16, but I had to go through the process of, you know, making mistakes and learning, but is finding that person that can be the driver or the, the, the president in our case, what, well, you know, we look for things like what I look for is, you know, who's a lifelong student. Cause that's really at the core of our culture. Dan is, through and through someone that lives one of our key common service language items, which is if you want to make, if you want to make a living, work hard at your job. If you want to make a fortune, work hard on yourself. That guy is always working on himself. He's always doing the things to improve. He's always reading. He's always bettering himself. He's always feeding his mind with great solid stuff. You know, I, uh, you know, I, I'm hearing like character things is kind of what I'm hearing from you is in a little bit of, uh, you know, will, you know, of the will, you know, the will to do all the work before, during, after hours, like the stuff that we've all had to do in, in growing and scaling our businesses that just we do naturally. Um, and, and I think it was important, you know, for to you, for you to say, Jonathan, that you know, like you being homegrown, like there's a lot of respect in someone who's homegrown because you've been through the different things or the different layers of the business. So you're not having to come in and, and earn people's respect that's already given, but you've already kind of seen what they're capable of doing and what they're willing to do. Mm. Um, you know, so at least you have a good idea of who's the right fit from that perspective. Um, when you bring someone from outside the industry in, which I've, that's been happening as well. Um, I think it, I think it hits different, right? Um, and I don't, you know, I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing. I think to each their own, but what's your guys' take on people coming, you know, cause you know, that was your, that's what worked for you guys, but you're, you've probably experienced this with some of the other wrench gear brands too, on people who have come in from outside the industry. And so like, what's your guys' take on, you know, on that? Yeah, I'll take that one first. Uh, we, we've, we've had a mix. We've had a combination of people from outside the industry and, and homegrown people. And we've seen 
success on both sides. And we've also seen failures on both sides. I, I like the idea of going out and hiring a professional manager. We've done that and that's worked well. I could think of one in particular that's now the director of sales at our organization. Mark Stewart came from Enterprise Rental Car and, and they taught him how he was a professional manager. He learned our industry, adapted our, to our industry, bought into our culture uh, and then took off. I've also seen where you take a homegrown person that again is constantly working on themselves, a lifelong student uh, and has all the, the attributes and strengths to be a leader and is willing to learn how to be that great manager. And I look at a great manager, they have to be able to do two things. They gotta be able to take responsibility and hold others accountable. That's it, you gotta, you, you gotta and that's, you know, I'm talking about like, hold others accountable on the small things. Like somebody is comes into our office without their floor savers on. Somebody, somebody's wearing a beanie in one of our install trucks going out. You've got to be able to say, stop. Whoa, 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 hold on. And you gotta be tactful doing it. Hey, do I need to get you a hat, a ball cap or something? A service champions ball cap before you leave? So those, 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 attributes of somebody that's willing to take responsibility and willing to hold others accountable. And that is courage. A manager that has courage, if they have courage, they could come from outside the industry or inside our place of business. They'll do well. Yeah, I'd agree. I've seen it. I, I'm indifferent to it. I've seen it work well both ways. I've seen it not work well both ways. Uh, I'm just voraciously protective of the people. Our greatest asset is our people. I'm protective of the brand, the shield. Uh, and so we have also brought in uh, managers and, you know, Kevin's heard me say this before. I look at management and leadership as, as two different things. We brought in folks in, in manager roles from outside the organization. And when you find the right person that's hungry, humble, smart, said another way is I think Gina Wickman said it, you know, get it, want it, have the capacity. And they have a an empathetic compassion to the people and the assets. They believe what we believe in and they can hold people accountable and they are courageous when they need to be courageous. And uh, it can work very well. We've had some success stories there. Uh, from a leadership perspective, though, it, it's about it's always looking towards the future, but the past does matter and the history mm. matters and the keeper of our story matters. When we look at it through the lens of our customer's eyes, you know, they don't really care who the leadership role of our organization is. What they want to know is they've got the right people in their home to solve their problem and they feel good about it. So, you know, part of that history, where we've come from, what we're doing uh, really matters to the customer. And, you know, we want to make sure that our core values and our core purpose are ingrained in that person in a leadership role. And so it's worked more so for us when we have folks that are homegrown. I, I look at it, our executive team is uh, not 100 percent homegrown, uh, but but they're more heavily weighted homegrown. Uh, and it's just worked well for us. And that should be I don't know. For me, that's what made it fun, mm -hmm. because that was my story coming up from. You know, uh, I, I won't say the bottom of the organization, but for, for a kid that just didn't know anything, um, how can we inspire that for people to do more? The purpose of any of our businesses is to do that four letter word, M-O-R-E, create more, uh, more for the customers, more for the members of the team, more for our vendors, suppliers, and ultimately more for the ownership. But when we look at the members of the team, you know, people want to please, people want to do more, they want to create more, they want to uh, we're changing lives here. And so that's the fun part for me is how can we change as many lives as possible? And that doesn't always mean a step up the ladder. Uh, but in many cases, you know, if we can, if we can educate and inspire, um, that 6E principle, engage, enable, educate, empower. And on the other side of the equation, we can execute our game plan and enjoy I got that from the legendary great Ray Isaac many years ago in a peer sharing group. And uh, that principle holds true. So can you find people uh, within your organization to step up and do more? It's very powerful. Uh, it makes it very enjoyable and fun. 
Uh, and so it's worked well for us. Mm, that's great. Yeah, I would just I would just comment that both of you completely agree. I think where where I've seen it, you know, the homegrown people, yeah, we want to see those success stories. Where I think they have the slight advantage is they're able to develop that kind of EQ versus IQ because they get the the culture, they get the flow of the organization and how we communicate and all of this. And I think it's important when we're talking about, because I think this has been going around the industry for I don't know how long. It's like, oh yeah, find people from outside the industry. Like there's a ton of smart people. There are a ton of smart people outside the industry, but I look for more, you know, you may be really, really smart, but do you have the emotional intelligence to come into an organization and just kind of adapt like, oh, well, we ran this organization and super successful, but we ran it on kind of this very stringent and whatever. And we may not be like that. So can you adapt? Can you kind of flex in certain areas? So I think that's the important part is you'll know very quickly when you implant someone in your organization, do they get it? And I think that get it piece is like, do they get like the culture of the place? Do they, you know, they, they can sit in an interview and say, yeah, those are my values too. But like their actions speak louder. Can they really just, can they just fall into place? And, you know, I look at it as our like COO, like he came in as a different role. We've elevated him to that role. Well, I had three people on my executive team coming to me going, hey, we should put him in that role. We need that role. I'm like, OK, perfect. Like he's fit in. He's figured it out. He's got all the trust and the buy in from everybody else. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, I'm going to uh, I'm going to shift gears because I, I know I want to hit a few different topics. But, you know, um, and this will I mean, everybody on this podcast has, has been inc incredibly successful. And there's one thing that, um, each, each one of these guys have, uh, have done that have really set them apart. And it's something that I really appreciate because for years of me, you know, I've been in this game, 16, now 17 years of working, you know, doing digital marketing for home services companies. So I've seen a lot of, of really successful businesses and, and I've seen a lot of not successful businesses, but one thing I've always tried to push everyone on is, <clears throat> is, to give, you know, to, to, to don't be afraid to be different. Don't be afraid to, uh, you know, try do things to think outside the box, to be unique, to do, you know, maybe offerings that some others wouldn't do. Give the business a personality. We're not talking about doctors and lawyers. Like we're talking about plumbers and, you know, HVAC technicians and electricians, like, but you can still give the business a personality, you know, think outside the box. What makes you different? You know, what makes you different? Because in a lot of ways, you guys know we're in the entertainment business. Like we have to try and, and, you know, get someone's attention. Well, how can we do that? Either entertainment or education, right? Like, you know, if I can do both, it's a win-win. That's what this podcast is all about. But you got to get somebody's attention first. Mm -hmm. Well, then maybe you need to think outside the box. There's never been a better time, by the way, to think outside the box than, uh, than uh, right now. So use this as your sign to like maybe think, you know, to think outside the box a little bit. But but you guys have all done that, you know. And, and so I want you to just maybe share or talk back and forth around like, why was it important for you to, you know, come up with you, you know, to, to set yourself apart or think outside the box or be unique and however you put yourself out in the market, whether it be in the market or even to, you know, internally to your own teams. But what is it that you guys think was important about, you know, trying to, um, you know, just trying to be different, you know, than, than every other, you know, the, the thousand other, you know, plumbers in the exact same location who are doing the exact same thing you are. So, I'll, I'll start. I know Jonathan has a lot of great insight here. I've likely learned a lot from Jonathan along the way about this. You know, I, I'll just speak for myself personally. I, one of the things that how I approached business when I started my company in 2003, I wanted to be a people development company. I always thought, you know, the customer is number two. How we were going to be different is we were going to focus big time on our people and trust that if we focus big time on our people, they were going to then take care of our clients. And it, and it's worked, it's worked beautifully. Uh, it's, it's worked me. And, and I say that, um, I I've preached to our company that our true only competitive advantage in the marketplace is our culture. That's it. That's our only competitive advantage. Our guarantees can be copied. Our whatever our hours of service can be copied. We could we could come out with a a, a two year financing program. Somebody's going to come out with a five year financing program. Everything can be copied or replicated. What 
what is the competitive advantage is our culture. And so what is culture? You know, I, I've defined it like this. It's, it's the attitudes and behaviors of the team members inside of an organization towards each other and the client. So it's the attitudes and behaviors. It's really simple. How are, how are you showing up? How, how is our team member showing up every single day? And it's everyone's responsibility. Uh, and are you contributing to the betterment of the culture or are you taken away from it? I know yeah, or you're, that. are you a multiplier or a diminisher of the culture, right? So um, yeah. we, we talk a lot about that and uh, I've learned a tremendous amount from Kevin. Uh, Kevin is 99% on and, and when the 1% he's not on, uh, that just allows me to impart a little bit of magic to get him back to his 99% and vis a -vis. When I'm not on, I can't tell you how many times Kevin has helped me out of a uh, a spot or a jam that I'm on. So we've, we've shared for a long time, Kevin, I first met you not long after you started your company and you, you made a trip across country to come see us in Charlotte. I did. And uh, I was in the field at the time and I just met you briefly, but uh, the legend of Kevin grew quickly. And I've, I've been so proud to be in some, some peer sharing groups, even before our wrench days uh, with you. And I would echo what Kevin says as well. We, we've boiled our culture down to, it's the social glue that binds us. It's simply just how we do things around here. And yet, it, yet it's so much more. Um, but there's a magnetism to the culture that we have that attracts others, either other team members or customers that want to do business with us. We simply want to say, we want our customers to go, man, I like those guys. I like those gals. Um, and I, I want to connect with them in some way, shape or form. And then, the being unique and different part of that is what's helped us over the years is really challenging our organization to find some winning moves, uh, to find some things that our competition uh, either cannot do, uh, will not do. They, they just are not going to have the bandwidth uh, to do it. And we, we weren't at the size. I mean, we were a small business as well, but we really challenged the organization to think outside the box, not on copying a warranty or anything like that. Uh, one of our winning moves that still continues to be a winning move for us today was, uh, you know, expanding our hours. I mean, we mm. we're open till midnight, seven days a week. Now all contractors in this country will stand and go, I'm open 24 <laughs> seven. No, you're not. No, you're not. You know, you're not. So, uh, for us to really do that and get serious about it, I mean, we had to say, we're literally going to be open. Call center's open. The building's open. All support functions are open. The warehouse is open. And so we saw a need for, you know, people getting home after picking the kids up from school, a long day at work. That's when they come home and, and figure out that they have an issue in their house and our competition's phones were turned off. So uh, we took that to a whole nother level that even still here today, uh, aiding in our market dominance was, uh, being being available for folks when they actually discovered they had an issue. Uh, that's just one example, but you know, kind of looking for those blue ocean strategies, uh, not not the ocean not the ocean turned in red where everybody's already in, but you know, cutting a new path, blazing a new trail, and trying to find some, and these things are incredibly difficult and hard to do, and they should be. If you're looking for the one page cut plan on how to implement your winning move or your blue ocean strategy, it should be more than a one page plan and it should affect the organization in a positive way. It should involve every team member. And look, if you've got 10 employees, 10 members of your team, it's going to be really hard to work 6 a.m. to midnight, seven days a week. I get that. But, um, you know, there are other winning move strategies that, that you can put into your organization to make you unique and make you different. That's the operational piece, being there for our customers at a time when others were not. And the other side of that is, you know, the content, whether it be, Chris, you said it, education, or whether it be um, entertainment, because that's that's a strong currency. You know, being that outside voice to your market, engaging, inspiring, transforming people so that you are the ones that they want to call. You're helping create that magnetism for them to come to you. 
is equally important. So that while the operational winning move is happening, you've got to have the, the, the face of the organization, the marketing play, the PR part of that attracting others. And so that's what when on an executive team, when we get together for our strategy offsites, we're not trying to, you know, change the technician schedule or do a lot of X and X's and O's. We're deep in the strategy of uh, revisiting and reviewing what past winning moves are. Are they still winning moves? Do they have a longer runway? And uh, having an open forum for you know a creation of new ideas, new things. That there again, uh, we've got great competitors in our town. Highly respect them, but there are a lot of things that they're just not going to be willing to do. They cannot do. And I still believe that for for any home service business, no matter just starting, midlife or certainly has grown in stature and size to maybe even be a, a dominant market player, that there are things that your organization can do that sets you apart, makes you unique. Yeah, I, I think uh, you guys hit the nail on the head. I, I think I would uh, echo a lot of those sentiments. I think the one thing, at least that I've seen and and as it relates to culture is really understanding that the culture will change but under identifying those things that you don't ever want to change. Um, you know, when you've got 500 people, it's a little bit different throwing a party than if you got 10. Um, and it gets a little bit weird. I think that the important thing to remember is being really clear with your team on what things are going to stay put, especially amidst all of the things that are going on in our industry right now. You know, you've got all the technology and hell, the conferences I was at, every other booth is AI this, AI that, whatever it may be. And those are all great solutions. But what it can do is it can detract from what is truly important. And that is your culture. You know, as Kevin said, that is what differentiates you. Just because you use some fandangled software and now we can focus on the data more and we can monitor every call and we can do all of these things you still have to understand how that impacts your culture mm -hmm. um and it's a it's a you know it's a huge kind of thirty thousand foot view but there's a lot of things that you can do that are kind of boots on the ground that are going to really impact that um you can say you got a great culture but it's the things that you do on a daily basis that are truly going to resonate with the people on your team and then your customers uh that you're trying to serve as well Amen. You know, what, you know what I love about this conversation we just had about culture is, and, and Chad and I, you, we've talked about this before. There's so many people that listen to this and they hear culture and then they roll their eyes. Mm. Like, oh, mm. cult, like that's what you have to give me. Like mm. how many times have you heard incredibly successful, large business come on here and talk about culture? So Kevin, one thing that you said that I, that I thought was fantastic is, you know, you, you guys remember this? eight minute abs, then became seven minute abs, then became six minute abs. Like, because somebody can always one up the outward promotion, right? So uh, it doesn't always need to be like your promotion is better than the next, you know, your financing is better than the next. It is hey, look internally on what you can control, what you can control and focus on that. And, you know, to, to Jonathan's point, be willing to do what others, you know, can't do, won't do, you know, um, and, and by the way, like, regardless of size, uh, you can control your output, your own output, right? So, or what you do. So, so the, we, they can't all be wrong that cultures that a focus that has helped them scale, right? Like they've accomplished some things. And I will say, uh, you know, even, even in my own business, that's been so important. And, and to your point, Kevin, it was, people would say, well, do you, you know, do you treat your employees and your customers the same? And I said, I do not like I, we for sure put our employees first because if we do right by them and they are bought into the culture, we give them all the tools to the education that they need. We care about them. We still do our community service days. We do all these things together. They will take care of the customers. They will do what they can to be the best for our customers. That creates a beautiful little circle. This is the same thing. Focus on them, what you can control internally, especially if you're in a market where you know, these guys have large businesses and maybe you can't compete against them financially. Well, what can you do? You can control what your output is. Um, one thing I want to ask you guys before we move on from it is, do you guys have like documented culture? Like, is this a part, do you have a process built in for like, you know, uh, I think, I think this, I heard this from uh, Robert Kiyosaki one time who learned from, uh, he was in the Marine Corps. And then he talked about how there's a documented culture in the Marine Corps. By the way, I'm not a Marine. Um, but there's a documented culture. Do you guys actually have that as like a processes for, for culture internally at your businesses? 
So at 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 the at Service Champions, when we were five people, and I think Chad said it perfectly, it, things are different when you've got five or ten people compared to when you have five hundred. And and when I left the organization as the president, we had five hundred team members, just like Chad was mentioning. And it was really easy when we first started to be able to sit around the table and talk about exactly what Chad was saying, which is, okay, this is what we want to be known for. This is how we behave. You then go to 75, 150, 400, and you have to have what I call a common service language or a, a documented culture. I actually brought the book. It, it says, do you speak service champions? So very much like the Eng English language is the shared and common language inside the United States, so too does an organization have to have a common language. And a, a common language is like words or phrases that an organization uses that as soon as you hear it and it's shared, everybody knows what it means. Let me give you an example of one that we use all the time. No, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No yep. zero days, right? <laughs> exactly. You share that in your company. Everybody knows what that means, right? And it's like, okay. So one that I was going to give you an example that we use all the time at Service Champions is the smaller they think we are, the larger we will get. So understanding that it's all about that one-on-one -on -one interaction, being focused with the client, turning off your phone, understanding that each interaction, and I'm not talking about each time you do business with a client, but each interaction, because, you know, we'll do, if we do business with a client, there's going to be six, 10, maybe 15 people that are going to come in contact with that client. So it's managing each of those moments, what I like to call moments of truth. Managing those, making sure everybody understands that we want to give that client a small hometown feel. And what does that mean? That means that sense that they're our only client on our service schedule today. I want them to think that like, oh my gosh, I'm amazed that Bill, the technician, was able to give me that much time. He made me feel like I was the only call on their service board today. When we do that, when we manage those moments of truth, growth is going to come. But that's an idea, Chris and Chad, that's an idea at, at our company, how it's a common service language item. And there's a number of these, there's 25 of them in this book that we, mantras, phrases, rallying cries, we just happen to call them common service language. Anybody else? I don't want to over talk. Yeah, over. we, this is where, you know, Kevin and I have, uh, I, I've taken a lot from Kevin over the years, but we purposely, you know, uh, don't have that. Uh, but this coming Friday at eight o'clock in the morning here, I have a welcome to the team breakfast and I spend about an hour and a half with them. We, we cater in a really nice breakfast and I share the Morris Jenkins story. Uh, I, I share what it means. We are MJ, uh, what our expectations are. Uh, most of these folks have been on the team now for 30, 60, 90 days. Uh, in a couple cases, maybe it's week two. In a couple cases, maybe it's four months downstream. I try to do one about every other month. And, and there again, the purpose is, I, I think there's a lot of people here, they're like looking for the handbook. We do have a handbook, <laughs> but they're looking for the rule book. And I'm just following what I saw Dewey Jenkins do over the years is that, We've purposely not had a book. So that's just worked for us. Um, we speak it and we act it more importantly, you know, follow the model. And uh, yeah, there are a ton of phrases here at Morris Jenkins, that common language uh, that we speak. But the, that hour and a half that I'm speaking with them, I'm, I'm modeling those things and speaking of those. And, uh, I, you know, and I'm showing it on the screen behind me. I've got like 85 uh, PowerPoint slides and there's no words on any of them. It's just pictures and videos. And I narrate that. 
And I think that for us, it has made folks really, really comfortable to kind of hear it. Now, there's a lot of different learning patterns. And we have seen that when people can kind of see it and hear it, it really resonates with them. So that's it, it's very different than Kevin's. Kevin's has worked extraordinarily well. And I've always been jealous and envious of it. But we've just sort of modeled a different way to where our rule book, if you will, or our we just don't have a lot of that. Now, when it comes to like, you know, the Marsh Jenkins service system or, you know, we're, we're going to have procedures and manuals and things of that nature. But from a culture aspect, uh, no, I mean, we have kept that to where uh, we want you to feel it and see it and sense it. Oh. I'm going to try to wrap up what they said. Here. And this was this was brought on by Chris's eight, seven and six minute ab example, which I do appreciate. I didn't realize there was a six minute. I'm going to probably get back on the abs <laughs> here. I thought it was just eight. I didn't know if I had enough time. Um, but to me, you know, Chris, you said you said people roll their eyes when we talk about culture. And I think both I think both of them pointed out so perfectly why culture is so important, yet all these people roll their eyes. It's because culture is consistency. Kevin has a book. Jonathan does his breakfast and they speak the same language and they talk it and everybody's doing the same thing. It's because culture is one of those things, much like the six minute abs, you're not going to see a result tomorrow. Mm. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen the next day. It's not going to happen the next day. It's going to happen over time. That's how culture is built. It's not like we wrote something down on a document. It's like, well, I thought the culture was good. We wrote that down yesterday. Did not everybody read it? What's the deal? No, it's it's the actions every single day. It's the consistency. It's the repetition. You just keep doing it. And I think so many people are like, well, we wrote out this cool culture. Or my favorite is, well, we had a party. They didn't like it. Like I thought our culture was good. And then they go back to yelling at everybody on Monday. It's like, hold on a second. You have to do this every day, day in, day out. And it's a thankless effort. It only becomes reality once you do it, just like when you're working out. You're never going to see the results on day one. Sometimes it may take a year before you see that, but it's all about consistency. Amen. Wow. I never yeah. thought you would be able to turn that six-minute ab comment and tie it what I'm in here for. <laughs> this actually was pretty good. I'm very proud of you right now. That was so good. By the way, if you guys haven't noticed, it is uh, – Kevin is to Chris as Jonathan is to Chad. <laughs> we, Kevin and I are very much alike. Jonathan and Chad are very much alike. So we've got a great dynamic going on here. Yes, yes, <laughs> I love it. I love your energy. I, I love it. I could, I sense it. By the way, uh, Jonathan, I think you said this. You know who we got to get on this podcast is Ray Isaac. Hmm. To get him on here, what is he? What is he even? What's he even doing? What's he up to? Yeah, I, I texted back and forth with Ray uh, a few months ago, uh, and uh, it was good to hear him because I hadn't connected with him. I was in a peer sharing group, an ACA mix group years ago with him, and uh, I gravitated to, to him and, and also another gentleman, Wade Mayfield, because I was a young rookie, soon to become president of an organization. And I just I, I saw them as ultimate leaders. So uh, I can send uh, Ray a text and uh, check the temperature and and see if that would be uh, a, a good fit for him. I know he's uh, uh, his organization uh, out of Rochester. He spent some time in Florida. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I can if you don't have a connection, I have a connection there. I, 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 that'd be, that'd be fantastic. He'd be a great, he'd be a great guest on here. I remember when he was at a contractor of the years, when I very first met him back in the, I guess cause it's probably been 2016, 17. I don't even remember what it was. Anyway, Ray's, Ray's a past chairman of, uh, ACCA, uh, okay. he's a past chairman of, uh, Nate, uh, organization. And so, uh, yeah, he's been in some key leadership, uh, roles and, uh, just ran a fantastic organization. And, uh, I can't say nothing good things about him. When 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 Ray Ray is one of those people that when he speaks, it's like the old Kevin. You'll remember that the other two guys won't, but the <laughs> EF Hut, EF Hutton. Remember oh yeah, the 80s? oh yeah. I mean, they ran a whole campaign when when EF Hutton speaks, everybody listens. People so. listen. Yes, absolutely. Stop, collaborate, and listen. Actually, you're not going to be able to listen because you have to catch up on part two next week. Then you can collaborate and listen again. <laughs> You'll enjoy the episode with these guys. How awesome was that? And the second half of this is even better.